Unemployed and Afraid acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this episode on and of the land where you, the listener, are tuning in from. We would like to pay our respects to Elders past, present and extend our respect to any First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, acknowledging that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid, a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building your own business with the people doing it. I'm your host and fellow business builder, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into some good, honest small business chat. Hello, listener. It is so good to have you here for this episode, which I have a feeling has come to you at exactly the right time. When I first recorded this chat with my guest, Anthony, co-director of Awakened Lifestyles, I was left feeling so incredibly hopeful and strong about what I'm capable of as a business owner and builder and so much more confident in the challenges I've been facing, you know, the ones, the little things that become big things and how you sometimes feel completely stuck and in your own way. Yeah, those buttons. And when I listened back to edit this episode for you, I got that feeling right back. Anthony has an incredibly powerful origin story to be the business owner that he is today, but that's not where we spend the bulk of our time. In true Unemployed and Afraid style, we talk about all the personal undoings that happen along the way and the personal growth we experience by facing the challenge of building a business at any level head on. In this chat, you'll hear about following a passion through and across all its pathways to create your perfect business, allowing initiatives to fail to find what won't, the role that self-doubt plays in failure versus success, learning not to sit on ideas until the fear goes away, because like really does it ever go away, (laughs) why spending time understanding financials and investing time in that side of the business before you're ready is critical and embracing the journey of becoming the person capable of achieving the business. We really hit the nerve, the absolute heart of what we do here in building our businesses, listener. So I think you're really about to feel the solidarity feels. Let's get right into the chat. I'm here with Anthony Naud, co-director and head coach of Awakened Lifestyles. At Awakened Lifestyles, Anthony and his team do inner work, creating higher-powered humans to achieve high performance through finding inner peace. It's a company that exists to help high achievers find mental peace and inner fulfillment without giving up external success. As specialist inner work coaches, they're helping clients align with values-based living so their insights can match their external success. And they do this work through one-on-one coaching, online programs, coach training, corporate work, and speaking engagements. Supported by over 75,000 people online and working with clients like Volkswagen, Snap Fitness, Combank, Lorna Jane, BHP, and more. Having overcome addiction, obesity, and a lifelong story of quote-unquote not good enough to be a high performer himself, Anthony has created a business that serves thousands of individuals to live and perform at their best and is a sought-after coach for high-functioning humans, strong keynote speaker, father, meditation advocate, and conscious business leader. A company that helps more people to thrive is simply a brilliant reason to be in business. And Anthony, I cannot wait to hear your story of building it. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Thank you very much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. So just to get us started, I'd love to know, Anthony, how would your best friend describe you? Uh, I won't use my best friend, but I'll say my partner, Eve, she calls me an extreme sports person because I'm pretty intense and extremely, I guess, driven. And anything I do would be described as often all or nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that might be what most would say. That's a good insight. And I'm going to guess she's probably your best friend anyway. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. (laughs) I can relate to that. Extreme sports person. I think maybe that should be on your LinkedIn bio. But before we start messing with that, let's go all the way back. And well before Awakened Lifestyle was your business and your focus and your work, before the inner work, who were you? That's a really big question. I guess it depends how far you want to go back. You just mentioned in the bio, I guess the, the thing that most people might be interested in hearing is, you know, and you mentioned it briefly in the bio, is prior to getting into business and starting this company, I was a heroin addict. I was an obese, you know, kind of heroin addict who lived a very different life doing very different things to what I do now. And I'm really grateful for having undergone that journey and now being 15 years or nearly 15 years completely clean and sober. And, you know, having the ability to 
use what I've gone through to now be able to help other people. Yeah. So that's the 20 second version of where I was prior to starting the business. Yeah. Perhaps unusual or different from most, but that's what led me here. Incredibly interesting. And I'm sure you have told this story on a number of platforms. And you know, I could certainly listen to your story of growth all day long as, as part of that. And I would definitely encourage the listener to get a little bit more involved in your backstory and kind of get around and research some of that because I think it's incredible. And for this podcast, what I'd love to know is from that place where, mm. you know, you started to turn your life into your potential and what you knew that it could be. How and when was the first time you considered building a business to help others after going through that massive journey of change? What did the early thoughts look like? Really interesting question and really great question. So when I first kind of changed my life, like I said, I was overweight and deeply unhappy and really unhealthy, obviously. And so I got super curious about exercise and I, I basically figured if I get my outsides right and start looking good, then you know I'll feel better about myself and that's kind of the next step. And so I did that and kind of got really, like I said before, all or nothing, kind of extremely focused on exercise training, you know, nutrition, everything that went with that and found myself working in a gym. Just essentially at the start, it was, I honestly believe it was a bit of a pity play by a family member and her husband at the time who basically offered me a job kind of opening the place and vacuuming the studios in between classes and whatnot. But I'm so grateful for that because that sparked within me, you know, A, the desire to, to kind of change my own life. And then as I progressed through that, I remember one day my manager at the time saying, hey, you, you know, you considered being a personal trainer? And I just remember being like, what, really? Like, really? You think so? And he was like, yeah, I, I, I do think so. You know, have you actually considered? And I thought, well, yeah, that makes sense. I'm not doing anything else with my life and I'm really enjoying this stuff. And so to, I guess, succinctly answer your question, I became a personal trainer and I started working with clients. And that was, I guess, the first journey into like any type of business. And that, you know, grew and started to expand. And for me, business has been a real journey of self. And what I mean is I didn't, I, I often come across people and we work with, you know, nine figure business owners and for m many people have, the, they see an industry and they find a market and they go, okay, there's an opportunity here. Let's build something, scale it and then sell it for an exit. And I really don't have that mentality and never have. For me, it's been a journey of self where it's like, I love this thing. I'm super interested in this thing or whatever it might be. And as that unfolds in me, my business has also iterated in different forms. So that's kind of how it started in personal training, that which then moved into nutrition coaching, which then tr moved into nutrition and mindset. And then we made a real leap from that to what we now call inner work and having our own kind of modality accredited. Outstanding. I love that you bring that point up around the difference between perhaps building something that is profitable, you know, that somebody has researched and, and looked into yes. and gone, this is a market opportunity. I'm going to grow this and I'm going to get out versus the passion business, which is certainly where I, I find myself as well. I, I can't quite imagine myself sitting within a business and finding the just the energy and the motivation to build without having some sort of personal love for it. I think a lot of my listeners probably feel the same, but based on how we chat in the DMs, you have to have a bit of that love for it. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Like for me, that's exactly it. So I don't call myself an entrepreneur because I feel like the entrepreneur is that person. Whereas I'm just a guy running a, a bit of a passion project, which I've happened to, you know, grow into a business. And not by chance, by the way, because I don't, yeah, for me at least, that certainly wasn't the case or hasn't been the case. So yeah, couldn't agree more. There's a, an article that I think I've butchered this before in a podcast. So listen, you'll probably laugh at me trying to get this right again. But there's a, a great article that's been doing the rounds and it's the evolution from unicorn businesses to elephant businesses. So unicorn being yep. this, you know, mythical creature that you know, everyone's chasing the Ubers of the world. And then that heart-centered family, people, values, kind of first businesses that are now Love starting it. to come in. Totally. And so that's very interesting to hear that your business evolved with you as you started to go into your personal growth. I'd love to know what the early stages of your business looked like then, how you went to market, what you went to market with, and what that experience was like for you. Absolutely. So because we, I was always in service business initially with training, then nutrition, and now inner work. I think the first step was always really focusing on getting really good results, you know? And so that began way back in the day where 
you know, had PT clients. And I think my first kind of marketing initiative ever was getting results for my clients. And then I remember it seemed crazy at the time, but getting some of my clients and organizing a photo shoot for them and putting photos on the wall in the gym. Yeah. And then in the early days of, of Facebook, starting a group and just posting clients' training achievements on a weekly basis, or almost daily basis. I remember early on also seeing um, yeah, Facebook as, as a real opportunity. And so in the early days, we would market, or I guess a little bit further down the track, we would market seminars and we would do seminars nationally. And this is back then, like it was kind of wild. We would do seminars for a nutrition program or workshop and we could get 200, 300 people turn up, lining up down the street organically on Facebook, which was wild. And it, again, there was a lot of effort that went into that. We built you know, a bit of a following and whatnot, but it's just very different world to, to what it is now. So that, that was kind of where I first started. The lights came on and I went, oh, you can use this as a skill to go beyond you just seeing a handful of clients yourself and actually turn this into a real business. Yeah, this is a lever you can pull essentially. How good were the organic days of oh, social media? <laughs> the best. Yeah, everyone had to go and ruin that now, didn't they? Thank you, Zuck, yeah. for that. But I think you know, it's a brilliant approach and you know, I think we often forget the power of community. It's a word that gets used a lot in, in business circles, you know, build your community still. But what does that actually mean, you know, in terms of sharing the wins of your community and raising them, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, this concept's often underused. Absolutely. And I think the key for that I've learned and found, you know, both through mistakes and setbacks, but also through results is, you know, it, community is thrown around a lot and it is, you know, almost overused to the point where it doesn't mean much anymore. But for me, it's the intention around that that really matters. You know, like, why am I doing this? Am I doing this so I can pitch people or, you know, throw you offers? Like, because it, there's no elephant business in that, to use your terms, right? Like, <laughs> it's like, but if I'm doing this because I actually really care about these guys or, or whoever, these people, and I really want to serve and I really want to help them, that's where we've had real success. And that's where we've seen things start to catch a little bit and grow reasonably rapidly. I think that evolution of service-based business, which is often you know, particularly, I guess, for you know a training aspect or a training business that you're kind of one-on-one, -on -one, you've got a bit of a ceiling with your time there and evolving that into a unlimited a offering. Yeah. yeah, the programs, like that's a real step in terms of opening it up from a, a job or a business into a company that can really have massive impact. So could you talk me a little bit through your approach to doing that and how you maintained your, I guess, unique you aspect in that? It's a really good question. A lot of errors, like a lot. I feel that. <laughs> uh, yeah, like and, and far more errors than, you know, successes for sure. So lots of programs, lots of initiatives, lots of concepts that we trialed, started, you know, attempted. And with everyone, learnt a little bit more and with everyone, you know, varying degrees of success. But the way in which we did that was basically systemizing what we do. Yeah. So being able to systemize what we did one on one with people and turning it into a system of itself and then being able to package that in a way which can either go one to many or other people can use. So, you know, back in the nutrition days, we employed nutritionists and dietitians to deliver the message rather than, you know, myself one on one. And so then there was a team doing that. Um, we still do the same thing in the inner work where we, we have a team of coaches now that see clients one-on-one, -on -one, but we also have one-to-many offerings, which, you know, scalable. Beyond that, then we, we've also now got like an academy where we coach coaches and get them accredited too. So, and then they all kind of feed each other in a, you know, virtuous kind of cycle is the idea. I often think about this for my listeners, for the businesses I get to work with, but, you know, I think many of us think about putting together something to go to market. So, you know, putting together a new webinar or a course or an offering or an event, anything like that, right? We have these great ideas and then we go to put it into practice. And, you know, I know I'm doing this at the moment. I've got something in mind that I'm working on and I'm like, shit, what if I do this and I put it out and literally no one shows up? Like that, that fear is so real for us, particularly when we're offering a piece of ourselves out there. And you mentioned, you know, a few trials, a few starts, a few stops, a few fails in that. How would you or how did you approach some of those sorts of feelings uh, leading into the offerings? You know, there's the quote that says, fear kills more dreams or doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. And I think it's totally true because at some point you just have to 
put yourself out there. You just have to take the leap. You just have to kind of navigate it. I think having the back end understanding of the, I guess, the psychology and EQ based on what we do, I understand that to be a very natural thing, that fit. You know, that stems from what we call fear of abandonment, which is what will people think about me? How will it be received? You know, are they going to judge me? Yes, they are. Yes, people will reject your offer. Yes, hopefully some do take it up. And that's, and I think the, the key is understanding that's really normal. It's very natural. You're exposing a part of yourself, particularly if it's a heart-based business. So you should care and you should, you know, worry about that. But then the, you know, the same kind of principle I teach my kids is, you know, what we do is we feel the fear and do it anyway. You know, because I want to trust and respect myself. And so if I want to trust and respect myself, then I got to back myself and do the thing because otherwise I know I'll probably regret that however many months, years down the track. And Kim, in saying that, that's absolutely been my experience. There's moves that I should have made but didn't due to fear and or sat on. And then when I finally executed, I've gone, oh, man, like you should have done that 12 months ago or two years ago or whatever it is. You know, and doing that, and I guess the truth is doing that enough times to realize that was the pattern and then making a decision, actually, I'm no longer going to sit on this or allow myself to just sit on this because I'm just scared. You know, like if I'm scared, it probably means I got to move and using that as a cue to take the action, do the thing, put myself out there. You know, like Seth Godin talks about, just ship it. And I still use that, well, not daily, but very often myself. There's a couple of quotes in there that I think I might start either putting on a post-it or definitely yeah. putting on a post-it, but actually putting in the bio for this podcast yeah, we feel the fear and we do it anyway there is nothing that isn't scary about being in business it's just that's totally. just fact whether it's totally. the emotional undoing that you go through when you see yourself struggle and you see yourself get frustrated through to the financial responsibilities that that fall on your shoulders and just that push pull through the process it's why i just think business owners are they're just the bravest humans in the world hundred percent. Like a lot of the stuff we do is often technically quite easy. You know, like I have to make a phone call. I have to put a post up. I have to launch an offer. I have to have a sales conversation, whatever it might be. Follow the scripts. Technically very easy, but emotionally incredibly difficult, particularly if you're connected to, you know, the outcome and, you know, like you, you talked about a passion project type of deal. I love that you even bring up the post. Like that is so simply an undoing for so many of us as well. Just like right. no matter how big or small our social networks are, putting out a piece of work or putting out an opinion about the industry that you're in, I find that really challenging. Like you know, I did that the other day. I put up an opinion about you know, I'm in the podcasting industry as a creator, as a podcaster, but I also am a strategist for brands who want to start a podcast as well. And I put up an opinion that I have, a rather strong one. And I had someone drop into my DMs being like, oh, I just really want to hear more about like why you think like that. And immediately it was like fight or flight. I was like, oh, that's it. Oh, this is going to go terribly. <laughs> I'm so nervous. What's this person yep. going to say? And, you know, it's so it's amazing that you bring that up that, you know, it's a shared feeling that so many of us have. You put yourself out there and it's like, oh, even just a post is scary. Absolutely. And all humans have it and it's very real. And I think everyone's heard it a thousand times. Like unless you've got people hating on what you're doing, you're probably not doing anything noteworthy, but it's actually true to a degree, right? Like if you're just doing the vanilla watered down, making everyone happy thing, you might go okay, but you're probably not going to get that cut through or that reach where people actually start to build a movement around your business or your passion or whatever, because you're not really standing for anything if, you know, falling for everyone kind of thing. So yes, it's scary, but I, I also believe it's you know, again, the lens that I work in, it's also a pathway. Business is also a pathway to like real self mastery. It's going to bring up all your shit. You know, it's going to bring up all those fears. It's going to bring like the number of times we've had people that are scared to have money conversations, you know, sales training stuff like that, the posting, the getting on social media, all that type of stuff. It's like, yeah, they're parts. If we change the lens and we go, that's part of you that needs to be developed. And you're just lucky enough to have a business that's highlighting that. It's like amazing. This is how you become the person you're meant to be. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, absolutely preaching to the converted here in terms of the personal <laughs> sure. growth that comes from business yeah. because nothing I've done in my life has compared to this experience of building something. And I'm sure the listener can relate at no matter what stage that we're in. You touch on something there close to my heart, something I think a lot about. Uh, you did it in the sales context, of course, which is asking for money and asking for your value and mm -hmm. you know getting that back from clients. So I'd love to explore a little bit more about that Yes, I've heard you ask others about this question on, on some of the others. So I'm wondering if we're going to get this one. Yeah. 
Yes, I have so much interest in this. And from a perspective of, you know, how do you manage your personal financial fears in terms of investing in yourself and in this business and into grow? But also on the other side of the financial coin, how do you or how have you gotten the confidence or the learnings through the process to price yourself, to ask for what you're worth and to hopefully go a little bit higher? Absolutely. So uh, I would absolutely recommend nobody does what I've done. Just <laughs> as a blanket Good disclaimer. disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, like I guess I was really fortunate to start in that gym environment where I was. they had clients. I could just kind of leverage off those clients. I had little kind of outgoings at the time. I was rebuilding my life, you know, at about 24 years old. And so the, I had a bit of a buffer there. I didn't have children. I didn't have dependents. I didn't have massive responsibilities, mortgages, things like that. So I could kind of just go all in, you know. I also leveraged off partnerships reasonably early. So I went into partnership with those gym owners and they had the network and they had capital. And again, I'm really grateful and fortunate for that. And I was basically, I guess, the workhorse. And I was happy to do that. You know, I was happy to put in the time, put in the hours. That's what I had. That's what I could bring to the table. So for me, that was super valuable. Yeah. And super, yeah, it wouldn't have happened without it. And so with that, we've just then started our own business, you know, off the back of that about eight or nine years ago, Awaken Lifestyles when we rebranded it. And we've been self-funded from the start, like entirely. There's no investor money or anything like that. And we've just taken massive bets. Some of them we've won, some of them we've lost. You know, there's definitely been times where it's like, holy shit, are we going to be able to pay staff this week? Like, honestly, you know, there's definitely been times where my partner, even I sit there and go like, is this actually going to work? Are we going to get somewhere like, you know, and more times than I think most people would admit. And what I found over time in having real authentic conversations like yourself, and that's why I think this podcast is so amazing, is that everyone wants to tell you the, you know, the amazing 10x story, right? And everyone's quick to tell you that very few are going to tell you, particularly when they're in it, hey, we're actually struggling to even pay staff this month, right? Or we've got a bloody debt to the ATO that I don't know if I'm going to be able to, whatever, yeah, like all the stuff. That, that actually really goes on behind the scenes. And so I think it's super important like you're doing to bring that to light. And yeah, so we've definitely been through that. And then we've also been through times where it's like, holy moly, this is amazing. Like we've created something here, you know, special here. So yeah, that that's kind of how we've done it. Mostly learning by like, if I had any kind of advice to add there is I would have definitely spent more time earlier on getting really sound financial advice. And before hire, making different hires, I would have hired a CFO or, you know, a, a locum CFO. That's because that's not my skill set personally. And it's not, and I've just kind of been a, I'm a high risk kind of guy coming from my background. It's like, you know, we just do whatever it takes. I'll just make it happen. I have, you know, a high level of belief in myself. And in hindsight, probably would have achieved more sooner had we had more sound financial kind of advice. I am not sure whether or not a locum CFO is a term that anyone else has heard, but I have not. And if it is not Google searched yet by somebody offering this service, geez, that's an opportunity. What a cool idea to, you know, for someone to be out there. I mean, you know, if, if this is a thing, please listen We've up. got one. DM me. That's one. so cool. Yeah. So it's just, it's essentially a part-time CFO. I love it. Someone who can come in and give you that financial advice. I don't know if you're anything like me, Anthony. It's I have a real passion for, for money, <laughs> naturally. I'm in yeah. business. <laughs> but, you know, I I have a not a natural love of numbers and Absolutely. I'm not particularly close to that. And so I think, you know, that's one area that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that, you know, bringing in some extra advice and just thinking about it up, you know, a little bit earlier up the stream. And I think it's also, at least, you know, in my experience, it's a byproduct of being, it's the one thing you can keep pushing aside often. You know, if I have to service that client, if I have to get back to those emails, if I have to make those sales, if I have to do that thing, oh, that monthly review of the numbers, that can get pushed. And then that gets pushed mm -hmm. and pushed again. And now it's a quarterly review, which didn't happen, you know. So now I'm kind of building the plane as it flies financially. So I, I think there's a little bit of that can often be the case too. Like particularly in early startup mode, it's like, there's just so much to do. Or maybe that's just me, but that's been my experience. No, it's definitely not you. I, I had this really positive approach to it where I was going to every Monday sit down for an hour and a half. I've got this really great spreadsheet that's, right. you know, someone's shared a great template with me and I've got it almost like every week I'm going to enter 
every single line item and I'm going to go through and I'm going to know it. And I think I did it two weeks <laughs> and I haven't touched it since. We're the same. I, I feel <laughs> you on that. I feel you on that. So outsource that to someone that actually loves it, is good at it and can provide me the data that I need to make the decisions. Yeah, it's great yep. advice. On the flip side of that, you know, you are in a service-based industry. You're offering a a very powerful service. You know, you're talking about changing people's lives here. How do you go about putting the value on that that feels both market ready and appropriate for the scale of what you're offering? It's a really good question, and it's something that we've grappled with over time. I remember the first time selling a program for like fifteen hundred bucks and being like petrified to ask for the sale try to avoid the sales calls as much as I could, uh, like literally. We've come a really long way since then. How do I go about navigating that? I guess experience and starting to work with those $1,500 clients to then going, oh, they're getting really great results. They're referring their friends, they're buying. So building a little bit of evidence that what we do is awesome. You know, I see some people, particularly in our industry, in the coaching industry, you've got some people that just seem to pull numbers out of a hat and go, okay, I'm going to charge you you know, 20 grand to work with me for this program. And I am a really big believer in value. So when we price our programs now, I literally will not take on a client, even if they want to join, unless I can see the problem or the situation that they're bringing to me, we can provide at least 10 times that value to their life. Yeah. So if someone comes to me and he's, he's whatever, he or she is in a situation, maybe they're going through a divorce and there's multiple properties involved and they're both running businesses or whatever. And, you know, like I know what that's going to, you know, I don't know literally what it's going to cost them, but I can have a ballpark guess what that's going to cost them. Then I have no problem in saying, yeah, you want to work with this, it's going to cost us about 30 grand. That's where it's at because I know there's at least 10X on the other end of that. How did we get there? Gradually over time, believing in myself, believing in the program, seeing the results, asking for the sale. And then to what we spoke about earlier, the, I guess the landscape of business for us at least has changed significantly. We used to be able to get clients line up off an organic post, so costs are a lot lower. You know, now I'm fighting for leads with thousands of other coaching programs online. And if you're in the paid marketing space, it's like you're kind of at the mercy of what some of these platforms are, are charging you to acquire those leads. So pricing has to go up. And the market's also gone up a lot too. So you, you just can't undercharge yourself. You really can't. And in, if I'm honest, again, speaking about some of the you know, this stuff that people don't want to share about, we've had some issues in the past where we were undercharging in hindsight. At the time, it felt like it was really good value, but in hindsight, the market had moved. We were still selling at our previous prices. And had we not picked up on it, that could have, you know, really impacted business long term. Yeah. Understanding that cost of sale and how it changes and ebbs and flows is just so incredibly important. And it, it, it sounds that through your story that and what I really am, am taking away from it, I guess, as a, as a key learning is the building blocks, the proof that comes in business. So as you get going and you do one thing, you show to yourself, hey, you just did that, no matter how big, no, no matter how small, you just did something. Now, let's just try and do it again. Let's try and do it again. So it feels like there's a, been a real trust exercise and like learning to trust yourself into business. Would you say that's a fair observation? Or if not, could you tell me how those building blocks have contributed to your personal growth and trust in yourself? That's a really fair observation. You know, like I, how do I believe in myself by, you know, I think I'll butcher a quote myself, Alex Hormozzi quote, which I think, you know, self-belief is building a stack of evidence that you're the person that does what you say you do, right? And I wholeheartedly believe in that. I can't go say I'm going to come and do a corporate work with your C-suite team if I haven't helped any C-suite exec do anything ever. I mean, I could try, but in my world, that I'd be out of my integrity and frankly, full of shit. So like for me, I want to be able to, anything that I say that I'm going to provide you or sell someone, I want to know that I can back that up. And as I build that belief by helping people or doing the things in certain ways, you do get that little bit more courage and you do get that little bit, actually, we'll have done that and we've done this. So like an example for us would be, we now do couples programs. And when we first started, we never did that. But the way that started is that we would have a client and we help them and they're like, oh, but my husband's really going through this thing or this is impacting our relationship in this way. And one day we just went, oh, this is a bit scary, but bring them in and let's do a couple session, you know, and see how that goes. And then, wow, that was actually really awesome. So now let's build that out. 
And then, you know, six months later, now we offer a couples program where they can come and join and do it as, as a standalone service offering. I love that. I love letting your business show you what it can potentially be by just trying things. But there's also something else you said there that I pulled out that I think is an important learning is if you want to sell to corporates, this is just one advice, but you can apply this for anything else. If you want to sell to corporates to your exact point, but you haven't necessarily helped a corporate before, go do some work for free. I mean, you know, that's kind of, that's something that someone said to me once and said like, well, if you want to prove what you can do here in this space, find someone, offer it, help them, use that logo, use that learning, use that to be like, hey, this person I'm about to sell you, you know, 15 grand's worth of advice here and know that I can do it and that it's really good. But that's just something that I took away from that. Have you ever gone down that path in terms of, I know I want to work for these type of people. Let me show you what I'm made of. I haven't done that for a very long time. Like initially, way back in the day, I did that with, you know, some clients to kind of to gain some traction. These days, no, we haven't done that for some time. But yes, once upon a time, absolutely. Worked with clients for free in order to get testimonials, in order to get experience working with that type of client. And then, yeah, built on that from there. And I think it's a really solid method. Yeah. And something that, you know, maybe it's just me. I've got a commercial mind, you know, spent many a year in a commercial environment. And, you know, so I'm, I'm always thinking about how do we get paid? But yeah, often it's like, hang on, if I want to get there, I might just need a little bit of a little bit of a lily pad just to kind of hop over just to, to prove that before I go hard. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in what we do, Kim, people will, they need to feel the trust. They need to feel the authenticity. They need to feel that you're the real deal before they're going to, you know, bear their souls and tell you all their deepest, darker secrets. So I do hear, and you know, you read these inspirational business books or quotes or whatever they are. And some people just kind of, oh, just went and pitched to the CEO and won all this work and fantastic for them. But I think I might be a little bit more old school where I'm like, I kind of need to earn my stripes a little bit and I kind of need to prove that this is who I am. And that's a fantastic way to do that. What do you wish that more people knew about their potential as humans in business? I might get a bit on you. I but love woo-woo, don't what worry. I, <laughs> what I honestly believe is, you know, it, it, within our business, we have this concept that we call best day ever practice that we've got in our modality. And it's essentially a visualization practice where we will walk people through step by step what their best day ever looks like. Yeah. And so it's like, close your eyes and we guide you through it and people can see what that is. My personal belief is that what comes up inside of that is what's possible for you. Right. And so if I have this idea and I have this business and what comes up in my vision or my kind of best day ever ultimate scenario is this thing that's doing X, Y, Z or helping this many people or achieving blah, blah, blah. I personally believe that's what's possible for you. Yeah. As long as it's in, in alignment, you do it from the right place, not just a sense of ego saying, I want to be the president of the United States just to prove a point. Right. But if it's like, if I'm grounded in myself and grounded in my values, I sit and go, Hey, you know what? I've got this idea. And I take some time to flesh that out as to where it could go. Very few people had to be taught that. You didn't learn that on a podcast, for example. You didn't see that on a YouTube channel. You didn't read that in a book. That came through you from the universe, greater intelligence, life, your mind. I don't care, whatever you want to call it or believe in. That's some creativity that's come from within you. And I believe that's what's possible because the person sitting next to you will not have the same vision. I think that's excellent and just the right amount of woo because, yes, <laughs> it is in there and it is in us. And if we see it, we can believe it and we can make it happen. I'm a big fan of that visualization. And The business is the vehicle for you to become the person who is capable of achieving the thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the, so, so many people look at it and they're like outside in where, where they go, oh, I've got this idea. I want to change the world and this and that, but I need to whatever. I can't do that or I'm not there yet or you know, I'm too scared or I don't have the skills. It's like, no, that's the right, that's the point that you need to become the person capable of doing that. And that's when that's realized. And when we look at that as the journey from the inside out, if I focus on me becoming the person that's capable of achieving the vision, then that's purpose, right? And that's what we're here to do. And that's when the vision gets realized, funnily enough. And the stuff that gets us through those days that feel like an absolute grind, knowing that we're <laughs> on the way and it is happening and it is going to happen. I love that. My final question to you is two parts. It is, where do you want to see your business grow to? 
and in the effort of community because we are 100% here for businesses at any stage to grow and get there. It's all about community for us. So where do you want to see your business grow to and what can the listener and I do to help you get there? Oh, what a nice question. Our vision for the business is, and if I go back a step, back when I grew up, people, and let's just use fitness as an example, people exercising and being in, in the fitness space were seen as kind of like fitness freaks, you know, and Aussies were more into binge drinking and smoking and eating and whatever. Yeah. And that was more the cultural norms. These days you see there's a massive shift. You see chicks in their Lululemon and men in their active wear and it's now its own fashion, you know, uh, in its own right. And you, know, you can go to most coffee shops and on a Saturday morning, you'll see a whole group of people at the coffee shop in their active wear catching up, connecting. And that's become the culture now. And the drinking and smoking is, is less than somewhat. To answer your question, we want to see our vision for the business and the company is to see people doing inner work and working on themselves as commonplace as people now going to the gym and investing in their fitness. We want it to become a cultural norm, not like this weird thing that, you know, is taboo because I got to work on myself because I got a problem. It's like, no, this is the, the way you find deep fulfillment, happiness, purpose, contentment. And there never was any other way. So that's kind of the vision for the business. How you can help that is a really great question. I, I think simply by if you know there's something inside of yourself that you want, whether it's a listener, or you know someone who has something inside of them that they want, whatever that might be. It might be health, it might be wealth, it might be happiness, it might be love, it might be something that's holding them back from being the person they know they're capable of, perhaps some problem or roadblock. And you know that either you or the person you know has the ability to overcome that, but they're in their own way, reach out, put your hand up because there's people like us and not necessarily us, but there's people like us that can definitely help people overcome whatever is inside themselves to grow, evolve, become the person that they want to be. We've got a varying service options for, at all kind of budgets and price points and undertakings for that. Love it. I love the inner work approach. It is so important for all of these big lofty goals that we want to achieve in life. So thank you for sharing that. I'm going to make sure to have the links to your details, your website, your socials in the show notes. So listening, you can go click straight away, go get around it, have a look and uh, let's all smash out these lofty goals and grow these big businesses. Anthony, it's been a pleasure to hear your story today. Thank you for spending the time with me. Kim, absolute pleasure. What a great conversation. Thank you. One quick thing. If you're hearing this, you've listened all the way through. Hopefully that means you really like this podcast because it's pretty generous to give up 40 odd minutes of your time for it. If that is the case, please leave the show a star rating and a review. It helps me reach so many more people who might also listen all the way through and get some benefit and some support out of it. Not to mention it puts a real spring in my step to read them. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the podcast for small business builders with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid wherever you're hanging out and I'll see you there.